Mr. Allen, you child murderer. Why did you do it? Shame on you. Shame on you, Richard. You're going to prison for the rest of your life. Shame on you, Richard Allen. So Richard Allen says he's innocent, did not do it. But there is a confession here, according to prosecutors. Take a look. This is from a prosecution filing. On April 3rd, 2023, Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen. In that phone call, Richard admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the call transcribed, and the transcription confirms that Richard Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. He admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offenses as charged. His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly. Okay, seems like powerful evidence. Why on earth would someone do that? Why? Well, take a look at what the defense is saying here. The defense is saying the evidence shows that during his pretrial incarceration at the Westfield Correctional Facility, Richard Allen has been monitored, intimidated, and mentally abused by correctional officers who are also members of the Odinite cult. Two of those corrections officers, um, uh, Westville corrections officers, boldly wore patches on their Department of Corrections uniforms that proclaimed, quote, in Odin we trust, along with another patch displaying symbols of Odinism. Normally, corrections officers were within earshot of every conversation between Richard and his attorneys and Richard and his wife, close enough that Richard would have to be worried about any conversation with his attorneys and with his wife being overheard by these correction officers. The officers even required that Richard Allen be positioned facing the window where the correction officer was videotaping the attorney visiting with his handheld camcorder. The positioning of Richard Allen's body would allow the corrections officers to videotape Richard Allen's mouth as he talked with his attorneys. Richard would therefore not be able to privately discuss anything with his attorneys, such as, here's the, here's the, the big uh, part of all this, the guards are telling me that my wife and family will be killed unless I call my wife and tell her that I killed those girls. There you have it. That's the explanation. Let's bring back in our guests. Still with us, podcasters Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee, investigator Mike King, attorney Bob Mata, and joining us now from Ann Arbor, Michigan, clinical psychologist Dr. Colin King. Okay, uh, I want to start with Bob Mata, though. Bob, I want to start with you. I understand they're trying to get the physical evidence from the search suppressed. Would this alleged confession also be suppressed as fruit of the poisonous tree? That he wouldn't have been incarcerated if they didn't get that other evidence? They wouldn't have had enough to arrest him? Do you think that happens? Or is the only way to deal with this confession is by going down the Odinism intimidation road? I'd certainly make the argument that it was fruit of the poisonous tree. Everything that, that, you know, once the tree and the roots are rotten, everything that blooms from it is rotten. Whether or not Judge Gull would agree with that, I don't know. But, you know, the thing that's important about that, that particular statement is, you know, the footnote. The footnote, because when I first read that first blush, I'm like, wow, well, that explains everything. The footnote explains where Rosie's saying, okay, well, he didn't actually say this, but this is what he could have said had he not been watched constantly by these two guards. So, you know, the th everything that's going on with this, Vinny, is is insane to me. And, and, and I know Kevin and, on, and, and I were all in there for the last hearing when all this was being litigated in terms of them trying to get him moved. And we first heard about these guards uh, using the camcorder to, to photograph and to videotape the, the attorney visits. And it was a situation where you've got, we were not made aware that they were turning him towards the window so that they could see his mouth. So, you know, and as a criminal defense attorney, that's like me being able to talk to my client is sacrosanct in, in terms of privacy when I'm trying to prepare for trial. If I think that guards are even anywhere near earshot, I'm not talking at all. And I'm telling my client not to talk at all about anything substantive of the case. But your, your question's a fascinating one because I would definitely 100% be trying to get it tossed out as well as through the poisonous tree because it all stems from that warrant. If you don't have the warrant, you don't have the bullet. And then the question becomes, 
is mere presence at the bridge, which he volunteered that information. Is that enough for the warrant to stand? That's ultimately what Judge Gall, presuming that these women come in and, and testify, we're talking about the witnesses, that they say, hey, like Liggett lied. This is what we said, and this is what Liggett put in his affidavit. It's clearly a lie, and if Gall says, okay, well, I'm gonna pull those out, does the warrant still have enough probable cause to stand on its own two feet without that timeline? That's ultimately she, what she's going to be uh, charged with, and, and it's it's going to be tough for her, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It, it really guts the case. Uh, Dr. Colin King, let's talk about a confession. A husband. Does it, does it, why would a husband who's just been arrested for a brutal murder of two girls um, confess to his wife on the phone? What's, is, is there something to that? Let's, let's presume, number one, that, that um, he, he committed the murders. What would make a man who's been arrested for these murders confess when he speaks to his wife on the phone? Sure, so there could be a number of factors. So let's presume that that is what he did. Um, one reason could be extreme stress. When, when an inmate is isolated and um, at times teased by other inmates or prison guards, their, their mental psyche begins to break down. So that could be one possible explanation for why he would confess to his wife. Um, another one could be because of coercion. Um, maybe, and, and again, I don't know this for a, for a fact, but under extreme pressure from, let's say, prison guards. Um, and, and the person may be told, if you don't confess, your life is going to be miserable. But if you do, we will grant you certain, certain favors. So, you know, there's, there's so many reasons why um, um, an inmate or a defendant will confess, even though he may not have committed that crime. Okay, that's if he hasn't. But what if he committed the crime? If he com he's guilty, he did it. Why would he tell his wife on the phone? So, and, and, and you know, I have, I have assessed a number of mass shooters and killers, and it never ceases to surprise me what they do. Um, when, when, when one is isolated, Vinny, and, and you don't know what's going on around you, and you are stressed, you are um, depressed, you are anxious, you are obsessed with these thoughts. Sometimes it's the natural and logical thing to do because you want to confide in someone whom you know, not realizing that every single conversation is recorded. So it could be because his wife is his best friend, his wife is his go-to buddy, and he sees her as a sort of a solace. So that could be one possible explanation why he would confess to his wife. All right. Um, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, any evidence that you've come across that the, this Odinism exists in the prison, not just with the inmates, but with the prison guards? You know, we, we've talked to a couple of sources who have spent time up at Westville, that Indiana prison where Richard Allen is incarcerated. And, you know, a couple of them ran with different gangs. And some of those gangs definitely have elements to them that would embrace Odinism and sort of white supremacy. So we talked with them about that and sort of ran this whole scenario by them. And nobody said, oh, yeah, that sounds exactly like something I saw or experienced. We did have some people say that there would be, you know, occasionally a corrupt CO who might be down with, say, like the Aryan Brotherhood. And maybe they might mule for them for money, right? Not necessarily like they were also intensely interested in Odinism and ruins, but that they would basically get drugs for them outside of the prison and bring them in, you know, it, that sort of thing. More of an economic transaction. But right. I suppose anything's possible. Yeah. I, I, on this one, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah.